We've been talking about the transforming story. And as we've looked at this story, we've seen that it's a powerful story because it can transform individual lives, it can lift communities out of poverty, and it has the ability to build nations. Nations that are free, just, and compassionate. We've been looking at the breadth of this story. If somebody were to ask you, tell me in a few words, what is the Bible all about? So all you would have to do is remember four words. And these four words, if you unpack them, tells the whole nature of the biblical narrative. And the four words are the creation, the fall, redemption, and consummation. And that's what we have just looked at. But I want to focus for a few minutes on the word consummation. Very often in the church today, we speak of the creation, the fall, and the return of Christ. But we have a faulty paradigm and we are thinking that the world is going to get worse and worse and worse and when it gets bad enough, Christ will come back. So I consciously use the word consummation to change, hopefully, how we think about the end times. God is at work in history. And he is working to fulfill his purposes. And when the end of history comes, all that God has been doing will be consummated. I remember a number of years ago when I was working for Food for the Hungry, my friend Dave Evans asked me to come down to Bolivia. He was the country director of Bolivia for Food for the Hungry, and he said he was having some problems with his staff and asked if I would come down and meet with the staff and meet with him, and I said, sure. And So I flew down to Bolivia, and when I got there, I said, uh, Dave, what's the problem? And he said, well, the problem is my staff are Christians. And I said, why is that a problem? That's a good thing. He said, no, they go to church on Sunday. I said, well, that's good. No, he said, that's not good. Well, why? Because at church, the pastors talk about how things are going to get worse and worse and worse, and when they get bad enough, then Jesus is going to come back. And these same people come to work on Monday to Food for the Hungry, and we send them out into the communities, and what are they supposed to do? They're supposed to help bring improvement to the community. They're there to bring about the development of the community. And many of them are struggling because they wonder if their work on Monday is going to slow down the return of Christ. And he wasn't joking. And this is true of so many Christians. We think things are going to get worse and worse and worse, and when they get bad enough, Christ will come back, so there's really nothing for us to do today. We just have to sit and wait for the return of Christ. This is a faulty paradigm. And we need to see that God is at work in history. His kingdom is coming. We have a responsibility in the coming of the kingdom. As we saw recently, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, it says that we are to disciple nations. God wants to see nations transformed. So God is at work and we are to be at work. And when Jesus comes back, all that we have been doing and all that God has been doing will be consummated. So this is the breadth of the biblical narrative. But the narrative also has a depth. And this is the meaning of the story. 
Every culture has a story. And every culture ex answers certain questions. Questions like what is true, what is good, and what is beautiful. And the Bible answers those questions. Very often as Christians we don't think in those terms, but we ought to think in those terms because the Bible not only has a breadth, but it has a depth. It answers the basic questions of life. So what is good? What is true? What is beautiful? The Bible also asks and answers questions, what does it mean to be human? Where is history going? And what is the nature of creation? So the Bible has a breadth, and it has a depth. The depth is the worldview. The depth describes the meaning of the story. Now in this graphic we can see three very different worldviews. If you think of all the religions in the world, all the philosophies in the world, and you were to distill them down to their essence, you would have three basic possibilities. You'd have animism, secularism, and biblical theism. It's kind of like beverages. Milk, soda, and wine. They're all liquids that you drink. They're all beverages of one kind or another, but they're very different. You can have all sorts of different kinds of milk. You can have fat-free milk, you can have chocolate milk, you can have strawberry milk, you can have whole milk. But what makes milk, milk? There's thousands upon thousands of different kinds of wine. But what makes wine, wine? And what makes soda, soda? The thing they have in common, they're liquids and they're beverages and we enjoy them. But it's that very small piece that's distilled out when you boil everything down. That separates the wine from the soda from the milk. And it's at that level that we're looking when we speak of worldview. We can't take, a, a person could spend their whole lives studying philosophy or religion and never look at all the religions and philosophies that there are. But if you look at three basic ones, you've covered the bases. If you look at these three worldviews, these are the distillation of all the religions and the philosophies of the world. The first worldview is animism. And an animist believes that the universe is ultimately spiritual. In fact, some animists would go so far as to say that this reality, this here, is an illusion. This is Hinduism. Hinduism would look at the world that we inhabit and say, this world does not exist. It's only a dream, a dream in the mind of God. When you're asleep at night and you're dreaming and you think it's real, and then you wake up and you realize you're only dreaming, all of this is a dream in the mind of God. What is real is the spiritual realm. The physical realm either doesn't exist or is unimportant. The secularists have a totally different view. They believe there is no spiritual reality. There's no God, there's no angels, no demons. The only thing that is real is nature. And human beings are simply part of nature. We have come about through evolution, but what we are in our core is matter. 
because there is no spiritual reality. The third worldview is the worldview of this book. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What is real in this worldview? God is real. There is a spiritual realm that, in which the angels and the demons inhabit. And God made a physical universe which is real and which he declared to be good. And this spiritual realm and the physical realm are not separated, they are integrated. There's a relationship between the spiritual and the physical. These three different worldviews see human beings in radically different ways. They also see where time and history in very different ways. And they see the nature of creation in radically different ways. And what we'd like to do in the next few minutes is begin to look at how these three worldviews see man, history, and nature in such radically different ways. We'll begin by looking at what it means to be a human being. And we'll see that animism looks at a man or woman and says at the foundation what they are is a spiritual being. Somebody has said what we are as human beings, we, we are a ghost that inhabits a machine and what is the real is the ghost. What is the important is the ghost. In animistic societies, spirits inhabit the animals, they inhabit the forests, the trees, and they inhabit human beings. And so what does it mean to be human? It means to have a spirit. On the other end, the secularist says there is no spiritual realm. So what it means to be human, a human being is to be an animal. And we've represented this with a mouth and a stomach. We are a consumer of resources just like other animals. But at the core, we have no soul, we have no spirit, is all we have is a body. And when we, when we die, it's all over. Now what we want to do is look at the biblical concept of what it means to be human. I'd like you, before we look at our next session, I'd like you to think about the story that animates your culture. Whatever country you're from, there is a cultural story. What is that cultural story? Is it more animistic? Is it more secular? Or is it a biblical concept? And how does this worldview affect your life personally?